Hello, everybody. I'm Lou Hanessian. Delighted to be with you. Um, I'm looking forward to teaching a brand new course at uh, the Center for Global Affairs called Foundations in Trauma Informed Fieldwork, offered spring, starting Tuesdays, January 24th, 8 a.m. to 1040 a.m. It'll be mostly online, synchronous, uh, beginning on Tuesday, and it'll run weekly until the end of classes at the beginning of May uh, with an in-person intensive in New York in the spring. So delighted to bring you this brand new course. So foundations in trauma informed field work. Why does it matter? Why now? Why is it so critical to our work in the world? How does it strengthen the efficacy, the quality of our work, the meaning of our work? How does it support us, support our self-efficacy, uh, our capacity to appraise situations? How does it support our well-being, our professional sustainability? And how can trauma-informed field work support our professional and moral imperative to do no harm? So I've titled this short presentation, Do No Harm, Beginning With Ourselves, because in our work, we tend to solely focus on harm out there, on the violence and harms that are perpetrated on and experienced by the people we work with, that we support and assist as conveners, as interveners around the world, people in crisis, disaster, war, violence, active and post-conflict areas. And in our preparation for responding to these crises, we invest a lot of attention on analysis uh, of the many complex factors that we have to consider with context sensitivity, time sensitivity, response flexibility, nuance, discernment, kind of balancing and reconciling urgency with safety, a lot of factors, a lot of circumstances, and usually in a finite time. But what we don't often account for are the effects, both subtle and gross, and impacts of trauma on people and on us, and on us. And so trauma is not what happens to you, but what happens inside you is a way that Gabor Mate puts it. We can't see this, but we can learn how to recognize manifestations of this impact in order to center both other people's and our own sense of agency with trauma awareness and sensitivity. So the word trauma, let's just maybe start there with just a little bit of a, just a little uh, word etymology here. So trauma is Greek for wound or injury. It's become something of a catch-all, right, in our society. There are misconceptions about trauma. Uh, there are ways we see trauma in a purely negative light without understanding trauma as an adaptive response. And so just like perhaps the word resilience has around a lot of misconceptions kind of used as a catch-all, so is trauma. And so we may not know, there may be a blind spot for how trauma might relate to us and how it might relate to our work in the field and how it may impact the kind of work we do in the field. And so this modern perception of trauma as injury or wound uh, to the mind has its genesis in post-World War I uh, experiences of shell shock, which is what it was originally referred to at the time, and then went through several evolutions of terminology until we came up with a, a diagnostic and statistical manual version of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Post-traumatic stress disorder, and then in many cases, there is no post there is chronic traumatic stress. There is pervasive traumatic stress. And so it's an interesting framing uh, and one that will be central to the course and to maybe a different lens through which we can look at trauma and how it relates so essentially to the work that we do in the world. And so one of the, one of the key pieces to understand is that we may be unprepared, let's just say, for how traumatic events and experiences can compromise 
our own capacities for response flexibility, right? The ability to look at several options in front of us, not just two. We become very binary in heightened states of stress. We tend to lose context sensitivity, right? It becomes a very all or nothing kind of way of applying a one size fits all. We don't see the nuances anymore. We may compromise our sense of time sensitivity. We may not be able to accurately, a threats, uh, accurately assess threats. So our appraisal gets a little bit distorted. And then we need, of course, perspective at all times. Perspective is one of the first things we kind of lose access to in heightened states of stress and traumatic stress and chronic stress. So perspective and agencies, which are so central um, and so needed in high stakes and heightened um, stress situations. So taking all of this and kind of applying it into the relational field. So when we look at the relational space, because the work that we do is relational at its core, and for it to be effective, the ways in which our impacts are felt relationally is not always measured, but is essential and integral to the work that we do. And so I just wanted to touch a little bit on this idea of a vicariousness, the vicarious impact of the stories we listen to, the devastation we see, the hardships and suffering we bear witness to, whether we're first responders or whether we are collecting data or interviewing, interviewing survivors, whether we're gathering stories, listening to stories of atrocity, whether we are um, documenting or trying to understand the details around human rights abuses, those of us who advocate, who mediate, who document. None of us is immune to the effects of trauma. Trauma doesn't discriminate and often the brain doesn't distinguish between threats. So whether it's a single episode, a single event, or something that is continuous and ongoing and recurring. And we bring our own lived experience as well. And so because our brains, as I'll show you in a moment, are social, vicarious trauma is real. So the CDC defines vicarious trauma, vicarious traumatization, or sometimes called secondary traumatic stress as excessively worrying or being fearful about something bad happening. Again, the word excessively, right? We all tend to worry about something bad happening, but the excessively worry, perhaps the ruminating um, or the anticipation, um, being easily startled or feeling on guard all the time, right? That's hypervigilance, um, a very, um, common effect of traumatic stress is the hypervigilance being sort of hyperactivated physical signs of stress that we might feel. Now, it could be a racing heart, but it could also be uh, a sense of immobilization too, where we don't have a racing heart, but we have no bandwidth or motivation to move. We could have nightmares, we could have recurring thoughts. And we could also have this feeling that other people's trauma is ours. In a moment, I'll share a little bit about how we slide into this empathic distress where we lose the boundary line, which is so quick, uh, such a quick fast track to burn out for us. And so just a quick, quick, quick little brain science here for you. So, you know, we'll be studying um, the neuroscience of conflict and trauma and stress because it's important to understand this is not just cognitive. And once we understand how our brains and bodies are actually wired to interpret, to receive, interpret, hold, carry experiences and how experience shapes our neurobiology and how we shape each other's neurobiology through our experiences, we're wired for connection. And so from the get go, the brain is wired for connection. The various pieces of real estate in the brain are all centrally focused on how do we stay safe in relationship? You know, the brain has two goals, keep us alive, and then how do we make sense of this story? And we make sense of our stories through relationship often. But sometimes we can make different sense of our stories depending on the state that we're in. So we're wired for connection, and here's the interesting biological paradox. We're also wired for threat detection. And so we are wired to pick up a perceived threat, and that is something we can be aware of, unaware of. It can be subcortical, so it can be something that neuroceptively we're picking up a threat before we even have a cognition about it. And so that's a very important piece for us to note. So our social brain, 
is wired for empathy and compassion, meaning making and story. And the brain is also really interested in predictability. It is focused on pattern recognition. We have facial recognition neurons in our brain where we are reading people's faces, picking up cues, all these subtle, this multiplicity of perceptual cues in our environment, sensory and, and temporal and environmental, all in the service of keeping us alive and safe. And so we're wired for both connection and protection. And so to appreciate the vicarious nature of how we can absorb people's emotions and stress states, one might simply imagine what happens when we look at someone yawning, someone yawning or laughing or crying. We begin to notice our own urge to yawn, maybe even start to get sleepy. Maybe it's the reason we also lift our leg when we watch the high jump in the Olympics. Part of the mortar cortex and the mirror neurons. We pick up people's states. And so why is that so important? Because it's our brains, mirror neurons, and our propensity for emotion contagion combined with our neurobiology of what happens in our brains when we're listening to the same stories, for example which is called neural synchronization. So if we are in groups and we are working in community and we are facilitating a, a group story sharing, which we need to do in a trauma sensitive way, which we will also learn in this course, what is a trauma sensitive way of facilitating? What is a trauma sensitive way of mediating or of facilitating a group sharing of stories that have traumatic uh, stress at, at its core? So this neural entrainment, this brain coupling we do is just built into who we are and how we are. We absorb each other's states and, and we, are, we can almost think of ourselves as relational neural architects. We shape each other's brains by what we repetitively practice. And so as practitioners, we don't enter the field without our brains and our nervous systems. We don't enter the field without emotional intel, without a vulnerability to vicarious trauma. And so the negative impact of traumatic experiences um, on, on other people is not something that we're immune to. And so I think this is an important piece to, to really kind of understand when we think about um, the way we want to be able to look at trauma through the lens in this course that we're choosing, non-clinical, depathologizing, destigmatizing, and salutogenic. Salutogenesis is, or salutogenic, is referring to well being. How is trauma related to well being along a continuum of growth? So, when we start to become aware of the complexity of our own brains, of how our brains detect danger 24 7, even when we're sleeping, we start to remember and recognize that if our brains, react in fight, flight, freeze, and a number of other nuanced responses we'll get into in the course, how do our past adverse experiences tie in? How does generational trauma tie in? What is the impact of present day responses to a whole array of environmental, relational, cognitive, emotional, physiological stressors? Outside our cognition, remember and sometimes even precognitively. So we can start to see how we need to expand our lens. And so we're going to, in this course, realize the prevalence of trauma and recognize the impact of traumatic experience, but we're going to do so in a way that's non-clinical, that takes it out of the realm of what's wrong with us, takes it out of the realm of somebody being broken, a pathology model, and takes it into the realm of trauma as adaptive, as a creative adaptive response, as a protective response, as a neurophysiological response that our bodies are doing in essence for us. And so, yes, our bodies absorb and carry the impacts of overwhelming situations and our brains and nervous systems actually adapt and adjust, but that doesn't always mean it is centering 
wellness. It doesn't always mean it is centering resilience. And so that is really important for us to note because we want to understand what practices, what interventions can buffer against adversity. We want to understand how we can protect and sustain ourselves as practitioners so that we can optimally support the people that we work with in the field. This is where the relational space is so key. And this is why we say do no harm, including ourselves. We can't exclude ourselves from the equation. So we can actually learn to recognize signs of dysregulation in ourselves and learn how to intervene in time sensitive ways, in situation specific ways, not one size fits all, but situationally specific. And that what that does is it helps us to reset in the field. It helps us to reset in the moment to interrupt the pattern. And we'll talk a lot about patterns in the course. Um, and in this way, what we do is we end up finding ways to reduce symptomatology, reducing some of the impacts and effects that we notice in real time. And so the research on resilience shows that this is real time resilience. This is real time resilience. And so what works in the field, of course, may be different from what works and what's effective in other situations, which is why it's so important to understand trauma informed field work as being um, a very critically important piece for us. So we're going to explore the neuroscience of conflict and stress and trauma. We will also explore implications for developing a foundational trauma awareness that we can apply in our work across a vast landscape of human rights and humanitarian aid work and conflict and peace building processes. How does it impact and affect? How can we optimize? How does this actually help to make our work more impactful, more effective? So we're going to examine different kinds of trauma with context sensitivity. And even though trauma is universal, is ubiquitous, is inevitable in life, is not free of adversity, we are going to look at some of the uniqueness in trauma responses. And we'll look at the science of how certain experiences of stress impact the brain and the body and influence cognition something called cognitive distortions, why that's so important for us to know, when are we looking through a lens of cognitive distortion? And how does this show up? How do all of these show up? How can we get savvier, uh, more informed about how they show up individually, collectively, culturally, generationally? And so some of what we'll look at is effects of trauma, <clears throat> just very common effects uh, from both self-reported and also from the research, from the neurobiology, and from of the traumatology studies, trauma has an impact on the temporal, on our temporal perception. So trauma can alienate us from the here and now. There can be a sense of timelessness. Uh, there can be a sense that the past is present. There can be a sense of no future. And so it's important, we'll unpack all of this, but it's kind of an interesting portal to consider, well, well, if trauma alienates us from the here and now, and we do our work in the here and now with an eye to the future, and trauma is interfering with ways in which these temporal landscapes uh, work, then it behooves us to become trauma-informed, to understand that piece. Trauma can also distort our view of the world. We can be working with people who we may perceive as resistant, and yet we may shift that lens to consider that trauma can distort our view of the world, somebody else's view of the world, sense of self, perception of others, perception of what they're capable of. And trauma can create a sense of disconnection from our bodies. We can feel cut off from our own intuition, from our gut. Peter Levine, uh, who is the creator of somatic experiencing, uh, more than 40 years of research he's done, he says that trauma is a loss of connection. It's experienced as a loss of connection to ourselves, our families, and the world around us. And so when we take a look at the powerlessness and the helplessness and the lack of agency that trauma can often engender, we look at the importance of responsiveness and the options that we have in front of us at any given moment for responses 
a wider array is, is called response flexibility. So why is that so important? <clears throat> the loss that Peter Levine was referring to happens slowly over time often. And then we then uh, end up adapting to these subtle changes and we don't often notice them. And so the noticing is central to being trauma informed, trauma sensitive. The noticing is central to response flexibility and response, flex and response flexibility is compromised when traumatic stress gets in the way because of its impact on the mind, brain and nervous system, increasing cognitive rigidity and kind of all or nothing binary thinking that I'd mentioned before. So we may not always recognize the impact of trauma in other people and ourselves. We may downplay or overlook or rationalize the effects um, of potentially traumatic experiences. And this is also depending upon our lived experience and our uh, beliefs and social, cultural, generational mindsets and messaging around struggle and pain and coping. But at the, as the science shows, the body knows and the body remembers. So we may have intricate complex structures for how we make sense of them in our thought patterns, but the body is telling us something as well and the body is holding on. So, so it's an important piece for us to consider. Um, it, is, it is important that in high states of stress that, we, that we're aware of all that we lose access to that we rely on as practitioners in the field. We rely on our empathy, our compassion, our ability to self-regulate, to have a number of potential solutions to a given problem. We wanna be able to pause before reacting. We wanna be able to reflect back what we're hearing from people that we're working with. We both trust in the research and in the data, but we also trust in our own intuition. There is brain real estate for a reason, right, for intuition. But also we wanna be able to trust in our moral code. Uh, we don't want to, um, to cause harm unintentionally, moral injury. And so all of these, all of these capacities are not a given. These capacities are there mediated in the mid prefrontal cortex, easy access to us when we are self-regulated, when we have some, so a modicum of control over our own stressful responses. And that this we'll be talking about deeply in the course, how do we cultivate these capacities? How do we stay connected mind, brain, nervous system so that we stay integrated as Dan Siegel calls it? And so we'll get into that in the course. What we want to be able to, to understand is what happens when we do not cultivate an awareness of how trauma or toxic stress may be impacting us. We don't then notice how in our traumatic states we can lose the capacity to notice when our helping is becoming harmful. We lose the distinction because we lose that discernment temporarily. And then when our empathic concern slides into empathic distress, it activates a different part of the brain that is connected to our own pain, to anxiety, to depression, which is different from cultivating compassion, which is a more action oriented. We'll get into that as well. There's some fascinating science from Tanya Singer from the Max Planck Institute. So we can enter a state of burnout and the, the World Health Organization characterizes it in three dimensions, feelings of energy depletion or exhaustion, increased mental distance from our job, feeling kind of disconnected, feelings of negativity, cynicism related to the job, and a reduced professional efficacy, as well as a sense of not feeling like we're making a difference at all. And so this is important because, at least according to um, one study by Erickson, 40% uh, of aid workers experience high risks of burnout, at risk of burnout. Uh, Connerton says humanitarian aid workers are frontline workers, susceptible to the impact of personal or vicarious critical incidents. And so when we talk about efficacy, professional efficacy, it's a good time to bring in the concept of self-efficacy, which I kind of touched on at the beginning. When we're talking about building resilience to trauma, trauma resilience, when we're talking about building stress resilience with an awareness of understanding the applications in the field, we can prepare in advance of our work, we can 
uh, we can recognize when in the field, what we need in the field, and we can discern between when something is challenging and when something is overwhelming. And so it's important to note that not all exposure to stress leads to traumatic response, of course, right? Not all exposure to traumatic events and experiences evoke adverse reactions and symptoms. And I think it's interesting how Benite and Bandura say that self-efficacy is the belief in one's ability to cope. And so coping isn't is something we a lot of us take for granted, but it is something that has a lot of intricacy and delicacy around it. How we cope, the, expl the explanations we give for events around us is very central to coping. And the way we cope is very connected to, uh, to resilience. Um, and so I just wanted to share a bit about this course with you, hoping that you will uh, join me and join all of us in community as we really collectively deep dive in. Um, developing trauma awareness provides us with a biointelligence um, to prevent burnout, to prevent vicarious trauma, to be less impacted by stressors in ways that compromise us and that allows us to widen our capacity to engage with threats. So this doesn't just exercise our agency and resilience, it actually helps us to do the same for others. And so in this course, we're gonna study the science and practice of becoming trauma aware, resilience aware, and how to engage with uh, practices in the field like the scope crisis stabilization aid, uh, trauma sensitive communication, trauma sensitive interviewing to avoid re traumatization, principles and practices of psychological first aid. So, we're going to look at design interventions, global initiatives around expressive arts, for example, uh, when, when people who've been exposed to certain atrocities have been scared speechless and for whom sharing stories is not an option for whom being interviewed verbally is not an option. Some very potent work that's being done around the world. And we'll practice research-based resilience building uh, skills and more that don't just support us, you in the field, uh, but cultivate um, a relational space, a, a communal space with the people we work with that centers self-efficacy, dignity, agency, well-being, and professional sustainability. So I am looking forward to uh, joining you uh, in January. And if you have any questions, I would love to field them now. Thank you for your attention. I will go to the Q&A. Anybody have any questions? You can pop them in the Q&A. Any questions at all? What's so interesting about some of the expressive arts and uh, the healing centered uh, pathways that uh, some of the global initiatives around the world um, do very, very well is that people are able to find ways of sharing their stories so that their the trauma, generational trauma, cultural trauma, war trauma, um, does not seize them, grip them, and keep them in a frozen, stuck state, but gives them some agency. So there are some wonderful initiatives around the world in which um, we can see this and we'll study. How to heal from childhood trauma, yes, um, is a great question. We won't touch on healing from childhood trauma uh, deeply because that's an entire developmental field, which is so important. But much of what we will talk about and read about in so many interesting readings and resources that I have, um, that I'm curating for you, will give you deep insight into um, approximating some answers to that. We, we will be touching a little bit on developmental trauma in that many children who are exposed to trauma in war, in violence, in neighborhoods and communities in which they don't know a sense of safety, have nothing to quote bounce back to. So this whole model of resilience as bouncing back is perhaps not as relevant for our purposes. And so we're going to rethink and uh, reimagine uh, resilience uh, in through a very different lens. Any other questions? Yeah, 
Um, what's interesting about re-traumatization is that um, when we learn some of the principles of a trauma-informed approach, for example, from the CDC and SAMHSA, they talk about six principles, and that includes safety, centering safety, support, peer support, transparency and trustworthiness, um, collaboration and mutuality, um, empowerment, voice and choice, cultural, historical and gender issues. We see that when we learn to center our thinking around supporting people in traumatized communities through these principles, we realize this isn't a checklist and we realize it's not a linear way of approaching, but we realize that there's not just a deep principled way of approaching trauma, but each of those uh, sort of invite us into expanding capacities. How do we cultivate safety when safety in the, in the senses of um, actual threat of danger are not available? Well, what other kinds of safety are available? So it becomes very nuanced and very interesting for us to consider, and we'll deep dive into all of that. Um, do you think the childhood trauma are stored in the body and talking is not helpful? Mm. Very interesting, of course. All of our experiences are felt and interpreted and carried in the body. Trauma is held in the body. There's a book by Bessel van der Kolk called The Body Keeps the Score. We will read a little bit from that. But the body doesn't just keep the score, it also hides the score. Because there are places that the body and the brain and the mind communicate and say, we're going to place this over here in our long-term memory. We're going to place this over here in a way that we don't have to pay attention to it every day. So um, I think what you're asking is really insightful. Childhood trauma can be stored in the body, in the hippocampus and the part of the brain that, that mediates memory. Um, it depends, I would say, you know, there's no sort of one right response to say is talking not helpful. It's very individual to what is helpful. And that's where we center agency and say, what is helpful to that individual? Uh, in some cases, when we are talking about trauma that really keeps us deeply stuck, we're really wanting to work with the body. And so that's where the sort of somatic approaches, the dance movement therapy, the, the ways in which the body is engaged. This is when we talk about self-regulation. We're not self-regulating by telling ourselves, now just stay focused. We're self-regulating by understanding what happens to the breath, to the heart, to the lungs, to our bodies. When we are in high stress, we have less peripheral vision. We hear differently. We don't hear consonants as well. So there's a lot that we'll get into, and I appreciate these very profound questions. Um, does coping, trauma coping mechanisms vary throughout different cultures and regions of the world? Brilliant, wonderful question. Have any of those mechanisms been successful and studied? Yes, you know, we will get into this. It's really important to bring that up. When we talk about response flexibility and context sensitivity, we're talking about cultural sensitivity. And so, you know, what does trauma mean in various contexts? What does stress even mean? What is identifying of the fact that somebody is stressed in various in various way in various contexts? So uh, both the perception of stress, coping about coping with stress, the perception of trauma, what might be deemed trauma, or even the words one has for what is a traumatic experience are widely varied around the world. And so coping mechanisms are deeply of course, encoded and embedded in cultural rituals, practices, and beliefs. Um, so it's a very insightful question and very prescient because we will be talking about this in the course for sure. Very interesting studies as well, yes. Great, um, any other questions? Any other questions that are popping up? Um, I wanted to mention, you know, before when I was talking about various initiatives around the world, um, the, we will be looking at several. And one that we'll be looking at is called the Field Guide for Barefoot Psychology. And the Field Guide for Barefoot Psychology is very interesting, um, not the least of which is because it has some deep science behind it and now has some evidence-based, um, you know, research for why it's so effective. But it is interesting, it is an educational and self-care tool that was written by Mike Nickenchuk um, and colleagues from Beyond Conflict. Um, 
specifically written for forcibly displaced adults and people working with them. And so they ground their research in the belief that science is a right and self-awareness is an asset. So how do they teach this self-awareness? So this field guide is taught through storytelling and it's taught through storytelling through illustrations in the, the handbook where uh, two Syrian siblings living through conflict and migration use vignettes of their lives to delve into these deep scientific constructs. And so the field guide actually helps through psychoeducation and self-assessment and teaching a little bit about the neurobiology of what happens when we're stressed, actually teaches this self-care tool. And the studies have been really quite promising. Um, several months later, up to six months later, a lot of the gains that were made in people's capacities to self-regulate, even surrounded by uh, such difficulty, um, have, have, have been maintained. So quite interesting. There's some, there's some very powerful uh, studies that are done that I think will give us ideas for the wide range and potentiality for design interventions through a trauma-informed lens in the field. Any other questions before I sign off and let you uh, get on with your day? I want to thank you all for being here. And I hope that you uh, are curious about the course. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. You can reach me by email. Uh, and I hope to see you in January. Thanks, everybody.